Hi ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to another video. Now before I start this video, firstly a warning. Whilst nearly all YouTube videos are done by those of us who like to offer our own opinions, very opinionated we are, some YouTubers are sponsored, some like myself are not, but whatever motivates us, what we offer is still our own opinions based on our own experience. That's fine you see, but there's a whole new influence appearing. What is it? AI based videos. Yep, that's right. In theory, anyone can now produce a great sounding video that is absolutely convincing with completely no knowledge of the subject. It's really easy. And to prove it, I went to a popular website and typed this in. Are the Nikon Z8 and Z9 really the same camera? Almost instantly, I was offered this title. A really detailed description, a list of keywords, a video script that's pretty persuasive, you've got to admit, and even a voiceover that sounds, well, almost real. The Nikon Z8 and Z9 have been causing quite a buzz lately, with both cameras offering exceptional features so and what's specifications. The... Oh, many do have questioned whether they are truly. What's the problem? Well, the facts aren't correct, for a start. It assumes that the Z8 hasn't been launched yet, and it therefore it quotes rumors such as the Z8 having a higher megapixel count. They're both 45.7 as a matter of interest. It says that only the Z9 has 8K video, they both do. Burst speed and autofocus are not as good on the Z8, they're the same. In fact, apart from the updates, in fact it doesn't get anything actually right. But it, you know, it almost convinced me that I was wrong. And that is the problem. So please stick to those of us who talk from experience, from the heart, and although you may not always agree with us, at least we're human, maybe. Maybe flawed, <laughs> but human. Talking of which, ever since the launch of the Z9 and then the release of the Z8, I've been hearing stories about them. Online, people talking, people asking me questions. So I thought I'd test a few things and maybe dispel a few myths at the same time. I chose the top five that would affect me the most. My channel, my rules. So we'll start with number one. The Z8 overheats when videoing. Now this seems to be the number one online, online concern about all mirrorless cameras at the moment because they're becoming more and more powerful, specifically in the video department. So have I ever experienced overheating with any Nikon mirrorless cameras? Well, simple answer, no. But maybe I'm just not working them hard enough. I don't know, all my standard videos, including this one, are recorded in 4K, and I pretty much record everything in one go, including this one. So if I was gonna experience overheating, you'd have thought that I would have done now. But you know me, any excuse for a test, so I'm gonna set my Z8 to record whilst recording the back of it with the Z9, so you can see what, if anything, happens. I'm going to let the recording run until the memory card runs out of space or one of them waves a white flag. Now, as I set up the test, I realized that I could cover the second myth that I've read about too. That is that you can't record high resolution video on an SD card. So somewhat usefully, I can test both of the first two rumors at the same time. On top of that, I'll test the runtime we get from a fully charged ENEL15B battery to test the argument the Z8 battery life is poor. Why the B? Well, I reason that most of us have probably got a few of them as spares knocking about, so we'll be more likely to be using them alongside the improved C version. But for balance, I'll be testing the C version later. I tell you what, wow, three myths in one test. How very economic of me. <laughs> as you saw, I'm writing to a SanDisk Extreme Pro SD card with a 128 gigabyte memory. This card is the ultra high speed UHS-1 version, so I'll only get a maximum of 170 megabytes per second instead of the 200 and 300 you can get with version two. Now that said, I can still set the camera to 4K at 60 frames per second, and I'm using the H.264 video compression standard as I want the 128 gigabyte card to last a decent amount of time. We want to see whether the camera overheats, don't we? Or the battery runs out, or the SD card can't cope. 
Now obviously this would be a pretty boring video if we sat here watching the back of a camera for 47 minutes, so I must admit I've speeded up considerably. We haven't yet reached the end of the 47 minutes of the 4K video, but I think we can safely conclude that a decent SD card is easily up to the job. We have about another 20 minutes worth of battery, which isn't bad considering the work it's doing, and the ha camera hasn't overheated. Cool, well, that's put those to bed then, hasn't it? So the answer to rumor number two, you can't record decent video on an SD card. Well, yes, you can. Rumor number three, the Z8 batteries don't last long enough. Well, the B version looked okay to me. And more importantly, number one, the Z8 isn't a smoking pile of plastic due to overheating. I'm just not joking. It, it just pops up a warning sign apparently and shuts down, allegedly. The fourth thing I read about was that Z8 and early Z9 would not focus on white birds in flight successfully. Now, I didn't take a whole lot of notice of this until I saw that Dan Carr, who I respect greatly as a photographer, said the same thing. Seems like a trip to the local lake is required. I was pleased to see that there were plenty of gulls flying around the lake, and although I couldn't get that close, I really wasn't that too, too worried. I had two stunning cameras and the Z100-400 lens. How hard could this be, I thought to myself. Well, you can see what I saw, and I have to admit that I was thinking, oh my goodness, they're right, or words to that effect. I tried with a couple more gulls, and it seemed to get worse. There was no little tracking box, and I thought, well, maybe they're just too far away. So I concentrated on another group of gulls quietly sat on a log. And yet again, the camera didn't seem to be recognizing them. Hmm. Finally, the penny dropped. I was using the Z9 and the last job I'd done was in the studio. What a complete idiot. The camera was of course still set to the final human face, so I needed to change it to the snazzy new bird setting. So once sorted, we were back in business. My little tracking box is back and you can see by the photos that it's getting some pretty sharp images. Now I'm not saying that every time I pressed the shutter I was successful, but enough of the sequence to be acceptable. And that is probably more down to me than the camera, as you'll see by my shaky handling. Anyway, I thought to myself, that's fine, but the Z9 has a specific bird detection option since the firmware 4.10 update last month or whenever. So I'm not really using the same camera tracking that caused so many complaints. But I'll tell you what, I know how I can get around that little problem, the Z8. It's got a pretty much the same firmware installed that the Z9 had back when it was first launched. So I took it out of the bag and transferred the Z100 to 400 lens to it. I started with a fully auto detection. Why? Because that's what it was already set for, to be quite honest. And I also set the aperture to the same as the Z9, which was f5.6. The best I can get with 400 mil, but that's fine for birds in flight. It all seemed to work okay with the birds when they're just slowing down and landing. I need to see what happens when they're actually flying at a decent speed. By now I was getting a little fed up with them being so far away to be honest with you. But despite that the camera is still producing pretty sharp images. If we massively crop in we can see that the quality may be a little poor, but the bird's definitely in focus. That was one of my randomly selected images by the way. This gull actually flew closer, and so these raw files are a lot more rewarding. Until it flew away again, of course. Yep, there it goes. Hey ho, wait for the next one. After a while, I changed from auto tracking to animal tracking and did some more gulls. Even with my shaky movements, the camera can still focus okay. And these images look pretty good to me. As I normally say, all the photos in this video are from RAW, straight out of the camera and converted into JPEGs with no enhancements, such as sharpening, etc. The only reason I changed them to JPEGs is because the video editor that I currently use doesn't seem to accept Z8 and Z9 RAW files yet. Anyway, I was pretty happy with the way the Z8 was performing, even when the birds flew into shadow. I've tested white bird focus and tracking in sunshine and cloud against blue skies and woodland. Whatever problem people experience with white birds, I didn't seem to come across it so far. 
Maybe the Z8 firmware is better than the early Z9, but I can't remember having any focus difficulties back then either. For me, the camera was a joy to use from day one and the Z8 is the same. Possibly expectations can be too high maybe? I don't know. All I can say is that I wasn't exactly struggling to get in focus shots with these birds. I was changing position when I spotted the cutest squirrel ever. Now I know it's got nothing to do with the test, but I'm throwing it in just in case you're getting as bored of gulls as I was. And whilst we're taking a break from those gulls, would it be a good time to ask you to like this video? Even if you're not enjoying it, at least it's distracting you from doing the washing up or cleaning the car. And you don't need to go outside to watch the wildlife. Instead, you can stay in the warm, because I'll tell you what, when I took these, it was a pretty cold day. Anyway, sorry about the wobbly bit. I almost lost my footing. Anyway, enough of this madness, back to the test. A little further round and I came across some swans and I thought, well, you can't get a bigger white bird than a swan, surely. Now all we need is for them to fly, which eventually a couple did, by which time I'd gone back to the Z9. I'll show you them in a minute. Anyway, I decided that as I'd started off testing the Z8 by using the auto tracking, I really ought to see what happens with it if I used it with the Z9. Would it be as good as it was with the bird setting? Because surely with auto, it's looking for other things to focus on as well. Anyway, before I had a chance to change tracking modes, two of the younger swans took off, I told you they did. They did a graceful couple of circuits around the lake before landing back with their parents. I tell you what, it's moments like this that drives us photographers to sit for hours or tramp through woods and hills just to capture nature at its finest. Luckily, in this instance, I only had to walk from the car park. <laughs> anyway, one of the most difficult things for autofocus to follow is an object coming towards you. And despite the size of these birds, they're still approaching at some speed. These two cameras have pretty much got that sorted as this sequence shows you. If I wanted to be fussy about them, I'd have preferred a shorter depth of field, but that's the trade-off using lenses like this. F5.6 is what I've been given, and in return I get a lens that's both light and adaptable. So, excitement over, and a quick adjustment to the tracking mode, and I'm back shooting gulls with the Z9. And this time, I've done the auto tracking. The first thing I noticed was that my little tracking box had once again disappeared. It seems that the Z9 auto tracking doesn't appear to track birds in flight as well as the bird tracking mode. Well, who'd have guessed? <laughs> I guess it's quite obvious when you think about it. It's actually looking for a lot of different things as well as the birds. Quite possibly Nikon haven't bothered to incorporate that into the full auto tracking maybe? I, I don't know. It doesn't matter anyway because we've already got a specific mode for it. Anyway, despite that, the camera's still focusing well and the images are sharp. Thank goodness that the focus seems to be doing a better job of following the bird than I am. In my defence, the video really amplifies the movement. But at least now you know why I'm using a shutter speed of 2000. So, all I can say from my experience focusing white birds in flight is whatever the problem was, well, it's certainly so sorted now, isn't it? The focus and tracking did what it's supposed to do. It focused and tracked. And I got some decent shots. So that's number four dealt with. Finally, number five. Now, people have said that neither the Z8 or Z9 are great with low light and a high ISO scenario. And when I say people, I mean me as well. So let's put it to bed once and for all. These are taken with the Z8 at 8,000 ISO. And although they're not D5 quality, they're still pretty good. Now I know I'm cheating here a bit. Light subjects are always less affected by high SO than darker ones, so let's see a close-up of the next darker image just to check. I've increased the exposure and shadows post-processing. Pretty good, isn't it? I guess I can improve it by using a noise reduction program further, but to be honest, I was pleasantly surprised with what I've done. I do wish I'd taken my D5 that day because I could have compared them, but I didn't think of it at the time, and what can you do? Have you noticed the battery indicator's gone red? That's with the C battery, and I'd taken about 400 shots by this point. But as I'd done rather a lot of chimping, I later retested the battery in my hide, and after a total of 2 hours 18 minutes of use, the battery ran out. 
During that time, I'd taken a total of 2,890 shots, averaging 21 shots per minute. As the camera was on a tripod, I was using the rear screen for focusing, and it was on the whole time. I think that's quite a good performance from the battery. All in all, I think the Z8 has performed okay at 8,000 ISO, but I wouldn't want to make a habit of it. Anyway, over to the Z9, and to be honest, I'm expecting the same results as they both have the same native ISO, don't they? If we crop into this one, I think it captures enough detail to be acceptable. If I wanted a large print of a male mallard on my wall, I think I'd definitely be looking for a little more detail in the feathers. But as a bog standard shot at 8000 ISO, as I said, it's acceptable. As is the details on this goose. This set of the female mallard, on the other hand, are gorgeous. They retain the same quality as the first high ISO Z8 image I showed you. What, you can't remember it? Here it is alongside the Z9. I know I keep going on about the high ISO output of the D5 and the D6, but there's a good reason why I rely on these low light specialists compared to the Z8 and 9. Now don't get me wrong, I already said that they produce good results, but I guess the difference is that as long as the exposure is right and I don't need to tweak the raw file, the images will be okay. The D5 and the D6, you see, really help out when I'm really pushed for light and I have to adjust the exposure and processing. So hopefully that's been useful, and I look forward to seeing you next time when I'm talking about the differences I've come across between the Z8 and the Z9. You're gonna get bored of those cameras, I'm sure of it. Anyway, if you like this video, then please like it. And if you're grumpy because I didn't slag off Nikon, I guess you'll do a thumbs down. But if you really liked it and you haven't yet subscribed, please click that little button. And if you're already a subscriber, thank you so much. Why don't you share me with your friends? Don't be greedy now. Ha <laughs> ha.